<laughs> so, so I want to talk about what I'm, as, as you said, you know, what I'm going to be talking about is performance and, and Java optimization. And it turns out to be sort of, I think, you know, there's, it's, it's one of those topics that you can go deeper and deeper and deeper into. But I think all of us need to have at least some understanding of it for all sorts of reasons. Um, and then I guess the sort of the first thing is like, why is this even interesting? Why would any of us care about performance? Why would we ever want to optimize? And that comes back to our users. In general, users, if, if, if something isn't performant, users get cross. And then that turns into money, really. You know, they, they stay away from whatever we're trying to build and that costs our organization money. Or if we use more resources than we need to, then it can directly cost money as well. And so, of course, you know, sometimes for, there's some applications where you can do these really precise correlations between how fast you are and how much money you're making. So something like low latency trading or high frequency trading, you know, if, if, you're, if you're doing that, hopefully <laughs> this isn't your first introduction to, to Java performance. But even for those of us who are not doing those kind of really performance critical applications, it it makes a big difference. So Google and Akamai have, have done some, some research into this and they found, for example, that if you have half a second extra on your search on how long it takes to, to get your search results back, that turns into a 20% drop in traffic. So that's that's a that's a fifth of your user base has just disappeared. And of course, this this is old research. This is about 10 years old now. I think now half a second is it, you know, it, it's sort of not, I'm a little bit annoyed. It's I'm really incredibly irritated and I'm gonna stay away from this service. So similarly, if you have 100 milliseconds latency on your page load, then that turns into a 7% lower conversion rate. So, you know, we can make these really clear correlations between how fast our service is and how much money it makes. So, so then you think, okay, you know, I was a bit unsure whether I cared about performance before, but now seeing these money numbers, oh, I definitely care about performance. Um, and, you know, particularly if you're doing something like a trading platform, then, you know, it really, really matters. So for those, if you have a, a 10 millisecond delay, so this tiny, tiny delay for high frequency trading, then that turns into a 10% drop in revenue. So a tenth of your business has just disappeared because of those 10 milliseconds. So if you want to fix those, those problems and you want to fix those gaps, then you need to get into optimizing. So what, what is optimizing? Really, when we say optimize, what we mean is, please, make it go faster. But that's not actually as easy as it sounds, because faster isn't this sort of uniform thing. When we think about faster, we need to think, well, for who am I making it go faster? And when am I making it go faster? What time of day? What is this person doing when we make it go faster? And this is, it, it seems like a technical problem to make it go faster, but there's actually a really big people element as well. And this is something um, I've recently moved to Red Hat, but be, before going to Red Hat, I was at IBM and I was in an organization called the IBM Garage. And one of the things that we did was we applied design thinking to every problem. So we were consultants and a client would come in and say, I need to do this technical thing. And we'd say, okay, well, yeah, but it's very technical, but let's stop, let's do some design thinking first. And let's think about, what problem are we trying to solve? And often we would discover that these problems which seemed technical, actually we, we needed to think about the people before we could figure out what the right technology was. And that's absolutely true for performance. So when we think about performance, this going faster, even at a technical level, that can mean all sorts of things. So it can mean throughput, which is really, probably what most of us think of first when we think about performance so something like how many transactions per second it can be latency so how long does something take to start up when i visit a web page how long does it take for me to get the results also thinking about a system how long does it take to go from a cold start to where it's behaving as i expect 
It can also be capacity. So this is something that I was um, thinking about um, recently, well, today, in fact, um, because I'm traveling and the broadband bandwidth where I am is really, really terrible. Um, so I don't actually know if you can see me or if you can just see sort of, you know, a, a pixelated jittery screen because it's the bandwidth is so low. Um, but capacity, we can also think about capacity in terms of our data centers, in terms of our cloud usage. How many of these things can I fit onto a box? How many of these things can I fit into a container or a virtual machine? And that, that capacity suddenly starts to make a, a big financial impact. And so something like CPU usage then ends up being related to capacity because the more CPU usage, the fewer of these things we can co-locate. Utilization is another, another aspect and utilization can go in both directions. Sometimes we want utilization to be really high because we wanna pack these things in as tightly as possible. So we say, great, I achieved really high utilization, I'm being efficient. Sometimes we want utilization to be really low because we don't want our fan to be roaring and I'm laptop to be at 100% while we're doing a task that seems like it should be trivial. We want the utilization to be low. So there's sort of e even something as simple as saying we want it to be utilization, then we need to think, okay, but do I want it to be high or low? I could optimize in, in either direction. And sometimes these things can be kind of surprising. Um, there's a lovely story back from, from the 1980s. And NASA had two sites and they had a data pipe between their two sites and that data pipe got broken. So what they had to do instead was to, to get the files from one location to the other one was they took the tapes and they put it in a station wagon, you know, in a state car and they sent it down the road. And the funny thing was, although this seems like a terrible way of transferring data, the, and the latency was, really bad, the throughput was actually higher than they were achieving with their digital data pipe. So sometimes, you know, when we think about something like SneakerNet, it, it actually has some pretty great performance characteristics depending what problem we're trying to solve. And of course, the funny thing about performance is that our requirements may change. The problem that we're trying to solve one day may end up being quite different to what we're trying to solve the other day. And so then we need to, to change how we optimize. I heard a story a while ago about um, a bank and they, they had this system on the mainframe and the idea was that tellers would use it at, their end, at the end of their shift and they would push a button and it would send the data over to the mainframe. But this API was just sat out there and another team saw this API and thought, ooh, this looks useful. But the way that this, what this team was doing wasn't like an application for a small number of tellers in a bank. It was an application for a large number of end users on using mobile phones. And instead of calling the API once at the end of a shift, every time the page refreshed, which was sometimes every few seconds, it would call this API. And so instead of having, you know, sort of a few little requests coming in, this thing, you know, was hit by a huge number of requests. And, you know, sure enough, it sort of started to smoke. And then eventually it just said, I'm not designed for this and, and fell over. And SREs sometimes talk about how slow is the new down. But of course, no matter what you're optimizing for, down is the old down and down is really bad. So we need to try and think about how design decisions that made sense a while ago don't make sense anymore because so the world changes, the context in which our technology is running changes. And of course, the cloud, I think, <laughs> has had a huge change on how we use our computers. So you may have heard of this thing called the cloud. And it, it, it used to be that we didn't really care about how much memory our JVMs consumed. I mean, we cared up to, to a certain point, if, but if we had bought a server that had a certain memory, we may as well use all of that memory 
for the JVM. But now, when we're running these things in the cloud, all of a sudden, we're really paying per, per gigabyte of memory. So we have a strong interest to lower that memory footprint and also to, to lower the, the physical footprint. So, so suddenly, footprint that was not really important before the cloud is super, super important. And this means that, that sometimes technologies become much more interesting than they used to be. So I used to, many, many years ago, I used to work as um, a performance engineer for the J9 JVM that then became the Open J9 JVM. Um, and you know, I have a, a fondness for this technology because I used to work on it. So I was really happy a few years ago to all of a sudden see all this buzz about it and you know, loads of people tweeting about it and, and saying it had great performance. And it's like, hey, I helped with that, although it was 15 years ago. So <laughs> the amount I helped is that much. But but the interesting thing is when you when you dig into the the sort of open J9 is really fast stories, and if you look at their their metrics, you can see it starts up way faster. And it's got a way smaller footprint. If you look at the throughput after it started up, it's kind of borderline, but the throughput is probably a little bit worse. But the thing is that I, all of a sudden is not the important characteristic. The important characteristic is the startup time and the important characteristic is the footprint. Because when we're in the cloud, what we really like about the cloud is the elasticity of the cloud. And what gives us the elasticity is that fast startup time. So we can do things like serverless on J9 and they work way better than they would on, um, on the older technologies. Another sort of similar story, although this is a much newer technology, is Quarkus. Um, I wrote this slide um, before I worked for Red Hat and now I actually work for Red Hat in, in the Quarkus team. Um, and the, the reason I started thinking about Quarkus was I was talking to some of the Red Hat engineers and they told me this, this story, which is that one of the, they were at a, a conference, a physical conference, so you can tell how long ago this was. And they were at the booth and they had, you know, all of, all of the Red Hatters were on the booth, not just the, the techies. So they had a project manager on the booth and he was demoing Quarkus to people as they came by, but he wasn't necessarily the most technical person. And so he forgot that when you demo something, you should turn it off at the end. So he demoed Quarkus and then the person went away and then he demoed Quarkus again and then the person went away. And at the end of the day, he discovered he had 120 instances of Quarkus running on his machine. But the amazing thing is that the thing that's so cute and cool is that he didn't notice his machine was behaving exactly the same as it was before because Quarkus was so light and so small that it, it, you could pack them in that tightly. So what, what's happening with Quarkus really is, is it's trading off some flexibility. It's not trying to be something that supports every single programming model. But what you get for that trade-off is you get the startup speed and the footprint and it behaves really, really well in the cloud. So I'm still I'm, I'm a bit worried now because I, I do work in that team and I have been telling this story, which isn't totally flattering to this project manager. I don't actually know who they are, but I'm waiting for someday someone's going to come to me and say, oh, I am the project manager from your story. And I do not like that story. And actually, I am quite technical. Thank you very much. So we shall see. I may have to stop telling that story at some point. Another thing that we, we should be thinking about and maybe optimizing for is what does our technology do when it's not doing anything? And this seems like kind of a ridiculous thing to optimize for because we don't ever imagine that our technology is gonna be doing nothing. But the pragmatic reality is that so, so often we start these servers and then we kind of forget about them or then the utilization isn't, isn't you know as high as we hoped. And so they end up just sitting idle and they consume a lot of resources. So I, I see this particularly with something like Kubernetes where a Kubernetes cluster takes so many resources and sometimes we set them up to play with them and then we forget them. And even if we're not in that kind of play learning mode, 
there, there's been research that suggests that about a quarter of the servers in the world are running, but they're not doing anything. They haven't done anything for a long time. So this isn't one where nobody's using it overnight. This is one where we completely forgot about it. The person who owned this service has left the company. Everybody's too scared to shut it off because they don't know what it does. And it continues to use resources. So although it seems kind of ridiculous to optimize for this anti-pattern of having things that are forgotten, that's actually realistically a likely scenario. We probably should be thinking about it. Okay, so how do we, how, how, if we've decided which of these scenarios we want to optimize for, how do we even do it? It turns out this is really easy. What we have to do is find the bottleneck and then fix it. Okay, yeah, but how do you find the bottleneck? There's a whole bunch of, of problems that, that people fall into once they start to try and do this optimization. And the first pitfall is intuition. Often we have a we think we have a really good idea where what's slowing us down. But performance optimization is not the place for ideas. You just you have to be data driven on this. So you have to, even if you think you have a really good idea, you have to measure rather than guessing. And it's really important as well to make sure that you measure the right thing. Because doing some measurement and going, yay, I've got numbers, isn't enough. You've got to figure out what do my users care about and then measure that. And this is actually a, a super interesting topic in itself. I find it absolutely fascinating. So I think you know we can get a bit excited because we got numbers and we don't really stop to think about whether the numbers are the right numbers. And to take a bit of a sort of a digression, this is actually a business theory, but I think it's quite interesting and useful for thinking about optimization as well. When we have a metric, there's two kinds of metrics. There's leading indicators and lagging indicators. So lagging indicators are the thing that we actually care about. They're the outcome. They're something, how much money are we making? Are our users happy? They're really easy to measure usually. How much money are we making? We just look at our accounts. But the problem is, they're pretty hard to change. We can't just, you know, sort of tune the how much money am I making dial in order to make more money. And usually what, what, what affects the lagging indicators is leading indicators. Leading indicators are really easy to change. They're things like how much memory did I give my JVM? And they're predictive of a thing we care about, but the problem is, it's not always obvious what this thing is that we can change that then has the, the effect on the thing that we actually care about. So, so we really need to sort of make sure that we're identifying and thinking really clearly about, okay, well, what are my lagging indicators? And am I sure that the things I'm measuring have an influence on the things I care about? So I did, when I was preparing this talk, I wanted to do a few, a few performance demos. Um, and I, I should say that these, these experiments, you know, don't try these at home. They're for entertainment purposes only. Don't, you know, take these tuning parameters and, and, and go away and, um, and, and copy them. I did, um, I did an MSC a while ago and what I looked at was garbage collection. Um, you know, because I didn't want to pay for the MSC and it sounded, sounded fun and my day job was garbage collection so then I just sort of looked into it a bit more deeply for the MSC and one of the things that I got really frustrated by at that time was you so often would see this advice and you still see this exact same advice which is tuning advice and it says what you really want to do is you want to reduce the amount of time you spend in garbage collection that's sometimes true but it's sometimes exactly false sometimes Garbage collection can be an investment. And if you spend more time in garbage collection, you rearrange the heap. And that means that memory access is faster and your application will go act faster than it would have if you'd spent less time in GC. So when I did my, um, my original um, thesis, I did this experiment and I turned on the option that says 
compact every single garbage collection. And this is something that, you know, normally you would never turn on because it means your garbage collections are really, really long. And it's not, you know, it's we sort of instinctively say, no, well, I don't want to do all of this compaction when I don't have to. That will make my, my application go really badly slow. But what you can see in these graphs is that although turning on garbage collection on every single collection made the collections really long, the throughput of the application, which is the blue line, was actually slightly higher when I was wasting all this time in garbage collection. Well, wasting all this time, investing all this time in garbage collection. So even something you know so indiscriminate as doing all that compaction can give you good performance results. So I tried to recreate this experiment, and it was 14 years later. So I, I needed a workload. So I came. I used this open source application called DayTrader, um, and I was going to do it live. But then I realized that if I used JMeter to send load into my application while trying to stream, because we have a pandemic and everything is virtual, that was going to be really bad, and and my stream was just going to disintegrate. So I thought, okay, I'll I'll do it in advance. So I used JMeter, and the first thing I did was I tried. The exact same results, or the exact same parameters I had used years ago. So I said, I'm going to compact on every GC. I couldn't quite see the same results as I did 14 years ago, which is not surprising. So I, I changed things around a little bit. I had added a different policy. I, you know, changed the size of my heap so that it would, and then I, you know, changed things around a little bit more. I tried a different size of my heap. And what I was seeing was that no matter how I changed my parameters to try and make this point, which is obviously not the right way to, to do it, the performance was, was staying the same. And I should say as well, you know, this kind of experiment where I, ha I know in advance that I want to show compaction makes it go faster, and I sort of poke at it until I get the one data point that makes it show compaction goes faster. That's, that's cheating. That's bad science. But I was trying to make a point. So I carried on going. So I, I, I you know, sort of tried another set. And I, I started to feed my data into GCMV, which is a tool for analyzing and optimizing what's going on with your garbage collection. Um, I, I, I helped write GCMV. I was quite happy to sort of see it was still around 14 years later. So what you can see here is that there's some, some big pauses of like, you know, 0.6 seconds where you know, we had pauses of 0.6 seconds, which isn't going to be good in an application. And 21 seconds for this experiment was spent just in GC. I thought, OK, can, can we do better than this? Yeah, as it happens, we can. So my first set of results, I had 21 seconds spent in GC for a minute run. Ridiculously large amount spent of time spent in GC. So 4% of the application time was spent in GC. I changed a few things around, and I managed to get the GC time down to 12 seconds. So what was different? Well, when I looked a little bit more, I could also see that not only was I spending less time doing garbage collection, I was collecting a lot less garbage. Why was I collecting less garbage? I was collecting less garbage because I was doing fewer transactions. I had managed to accidentally massively lower the throughput of my application. Because my application was doing less work, it generated less garbage, and so I spent less time in GC. So, when we think back in terms of this framework of leading indicators and lagging indicators, I'd, you know, the sort of the naive assumption is that time spent in GC is a leading indicator. And if I can change my time spent in GC, I can make my application 
behave better. And so that transactions per second is my lagging indicator. That's the thing I'm actually trying to optimize. But actually, you can see that it's kind of backwards in every way. So the thing that I was hoping to, to change actually ended up affecting the time spent in GC rather than the other way around. And the direction of the correlation was backwards. So the other thing I should add is what did I change that made the application go faster? I ran JMeter on the same machine rather than a different machine. And everything says, don't whatever you do, don't run JMeter on the same machine as the workload because it will slow it down. Actually, that advice is bad advice now. Modern laptops have so much horsepower that they can run JMeter on the same machine with no problem at all. And what limits your performance is the network connection between JMeter and the workload. So co-locating them made it go faster. So what, when I was playing around with all of these GC settings and wondering why isn't it making anything any different, the problem is that I wasn't, the bottleneck was the network to JMeter and I was changing all these other things. And so I wasn't, I wasn't changing the bottleneck, so it didn't matter. And the moral of the story, I mean, there's a whole bunch of morals of that story, but one of the morals of the story is that time kills all performance advice. Even, even my own performance advice, something that was true 14 years ago, isn't really true anymore. So the sort of the extended morals of the story are, remember, GC is your friend. It can actually improve performance by rearranging the heap. When you're doing performance optimization, you have to find the bottleneck. And if you're listening to advice, you have to validate that advice independently. You can't just assume that it's going to be correct. And advice in general is one of the other performance pitfalls. It's something, of course, you know, none of us know everything. We all want to listen to advice. But we do end up in this situation where we read something on the Internet. And it's it's wrong. And especially because it. J, the JVM, you know, it's it's quite mature now and it's changed a lot over time. So you you used to you still see on the internet advice of the kind that says, you know, make one big method because method dispatching is slow. That's just so wrong because now the JIT will optimize small methods much more effectively than it can optimize big methods. You can still find advice as well that says reuse your objects because that will help the, the garbage collector because it won't have to collect them if you reuse them. Actually, on a modern garbage collector, if objects die early and never get reused, they're basically free. If objects live a long time, they cost a lot. So this advice is just totally backwards. We were talking about this at the beginning. We see all these sort of folk, wisdoms of you know to tune your dvm to use this command line some of them make sense some of them made sense a while ago and don't make any sense anymore and some of them just never made sense so like ben evans story of the 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 performance the command line that had the 819 because it was a typo for 8192 and it just gets propagated and propagated all over the internet some of these command lines are just really bad and in general an interesting thing about the JVM is that the faults are usually the best choice. The JVM has been tuned for the most typical scenario. This one is kind of more interesting. You see a lot of advice that says you should use a string builder. You should never concat strings with, you know, sort of just string concatenation. Is, is tech technically correct, but premature optimization is the root of all evil. So we need to sort of think carefully about, OK, this is correct, but even though it's correct, is it the right advice for my circumstances? Because time kills all performance advice, but context also kills performance advice. And we can end up taking advice which is technically correct, 
But if we if we follow it, we're not doing a major optimization. We're not doing a significant optimization. We're just doing a micro optimization, and we really shouldn't have bothered. And Jeff Atwood has a a great story about this. He you know he sort of did a, a series of experiments where he looked into okay, how much difference does it actually make to do a string builder? So he came up with this, you know, I think probably we've all been taught that a method like this where it goes in a huge loop and it just keeps using that string concatenation is really, really terrible. It's really slow. So I thought I'll recreate this experiment in DayTrader. So I trolled through the code base to find a place where it was using string builder. And um, I sort of replaced it with some string concatenation. And then in that loop, I sort of made it go through the loop way more times as well. And I had the exact same experience that I did with the other GC experiment. I was like trying to prove this point by doing this experiment. And no matter what I did, my application wasn't getting slower or faster or anything. And I was getting really annoyed. And eventually, I worked out that this method that I was changing never gets called. So I'd spent all this time optimizing or de-optimizing this method. It didn't matter at all. And we do this as people all the time. We get so excited that we know the answer, that we know the solution, that we want to apply our optimization, even if in the grand scheme of things, it's not really an optimization. And we do this in our code, and we do it in in our lives as well. So back when we traveled, I used to always make a point of saying, I'm going to take public transit rather than a taxi to the airport. And I felt, you know, like I had this halo because I, you know, sometimes it was really hard and really expensive to take public transit. And I felt, you know, I was making this sacrifice in order to be more green. But then I would get to the airport and I would get on a plane. So really the, the taxi versus public transit was a drop in the ocean compared to the impact of that flight. And you could say, OK, but every little helps. Surely it's better to take public transit in a plane than a taxi on a plane. Just because you're doing one bad thing doesn't mean you can then like go do lots of other bad things. And that's sort of true. But every optimization takes effort. It takes time. And so even though every optimization is good, Every optimization is an opt another optimization that we're not doing that might be more valuable. And one of the, the cool things is often doing nothing is the most optimum thing to do with the JVM because it's been really tuned to the more typical scenarios. So if you go back to to this example, everyone knows that this is slow, and it is. But if you change it a little bit, and instead of having a loop, if you just have a series of string concatenations under the covers, that will get compiled to a string builder or something like that. And there's similar things all over. So it means that actually this code, I think, is more readable. It's easier to write, and it's more readable. So we can, we can do this, and it's totally fine. There is no performance downside to it. And it's the same for GC. It's the same for how we use our objects. We see this sort of pattern in all sorts of places because the people who write the JVM have way, way more time and budget to optimize than we do. So if we write clean, typical, normal code, that's going to run best. OK, but what if, despite all that, I still really do want to optimize? At this point, we have to go back to measuring. You're going to need some tools. You, you can't just do it by guessing. You need tools to measure. And, and this is a, an observability concept, but it's exactly the same for performance optimization. What you can optimize is limited to what you can observe. We have to have that insight into our system before we can make changes. And a lot of the tools that have come out for observability are actually really useful for performance optimization as well. So I think we're in a bit of a, a golden age of observability tools. And there's a few 
categories of tools that you're probably going to want. You're going to want a method profiler. Visual VM is good for this, mission control. Um, if you're on OpenJ9, there's a tool called IBM Health Center that I helped write um, that you know can give you really lightweight, effective tracing. Um, flame graphs can also be really useful for this. I don't know of a good flame graph tool for the JVM. You're also going to want to look at what's going on with your GC. So GCMV, I think, is a, a very standard tool for that. Again, it's, it's free. Um, if you're doing heap analysis, Eclipse NAT is probably the, the standard tool for that. Um, you may want to go a little bit more high level and do proper application performance management. At this point, there are fewer um, open source tools available out there. There's one called Glowroot that I haven't used um, that is open source, or you can go proprietary. So you can go with something like New Relic or AppDynamics or Dynatrace. They're all excellent tools. And then finally, because it's 2022, your, your system probably isn't going to be running all by itself. It's going to be interacting in a more complex distributed environment. So in order to make sense of that, you need some kind of distributed tracing. So there, probably something like Zipkin or Jaeger is going to be your best tool. But that leads us to sort of another question, which is we all know micro-optimization is bad. It's very tempting to micro-optimize. It's very tempting to optimize just the, the easy things, but we need to look at the bigger picture. But if we're in a microservices system, the whole reason we went from microservices was so that we didn't have to look at the bigger picture and that we could focus just on our little bit of code. But it could be we optimize our little bit of code and it's actually a total waste because the bottleneck is elsewhere and some of these microservice systems are really complex. So, you know, Adrian Cockcroft called this the, the Death Star diagram. And, you know, if you optimize just one node, odds are it's not going to make a difference to the system as a whole. So even if I do everything right, I'm not, I could still be micro-optimizing. So in this kind of environment, what you need to do first is you need to do a little bit of measurement at the macro scale. And you need to figure out which services are hit the most, which services are affecting the overall performance, and then focus your optimization efforts on those. And it's a little bit like the, the bank example that I had at the beginning. The mainframe, they thought their, app, their system was performant, but in the context in which it was now being used, it wasn't performant. So you really do need to know that whole system context before you can figure out what to optimize. And you also really need to figure out if you're measuring the right thing. So Charity Majors always says nines don't matter if your users aren't happy. We can get a bit overexcited with our dashboards and we can have some metric that suggests everything is fine in terms of performance. But actually it may be <laughs> most users are happy, but some users are really, really unhappy. And that's something that we're going to care about. And queuing theory is, is absolutely fascinating. And it, in for, all, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but in a performance context, what queuing theory helps us understand is where the disasters happen. So even if the majority of users have a good experience, if some users get a 10 second wait, that's not okay. So we need to look at those outliers and make sure that those outliers aren't too terrible in order to make sure that we're not having these sort of really embarrassing problems. And I, I love this quote. This is um, a great article um, on, on queuing theory that, um, by Avishai Shalom. And he says, when it comes to IT performance, amateurs look at averages. Professionals look at distributions, again, to see where the, where the edges are, where the disasters happen. And another thing that I think we need to be doing is 
making sure that performance isn't something that's isolated just to the performance team because all of a sudden performance has these business impact implications and it has these cost implications and sometimes we can make a small decision as a software engineer that then turns into a really big cloud bill because it suddenly ended up consuming way more and we may never know about the impact of that decision so we need that feedback at all levels so Spotify have started doing some really interesting things. They have um, a tool called Backstage that's now part of the CNCF. And it lets them manage all sorts of things. But one of the things it shows them is the financial in in information. So they can see that this service is using way more resources than this service, but they're kind of contributing the same value. So maybe we should look and figure out, can we lower the resource usage of this service to save money? Because often we can so i've been talking for a while and i haven't got to the bears yet and this the bears i think came because i was talking to my children a while ago and probably like every single child they don't listen to me they don't do what i say no matter how many times i say it and so they have this horrible habit of they'll watch TV and then when they're done, they'll just wander away and leave the TV on. I'm like, <laughs> you've got to turn on the TV. And eventually I got so mad. I said, if you leave the TV on, every time you leave the TV on, you know, a polar bear dies. And that was an exaggeration. But it is true that the, the energy usage of our systems doesn't just have a financial implication. It has an environmental implication as well. And we were talking at the beginning about how we really want to be using technology for good. And I think we really also need to be using technology in responsible ways. And I think we have a moral imperative to avoid waste. And that, that waste could be electricity, just using more electricity than we need to, but it can also be hardware. So hardware is actually where a lot of the carbon from our industry it is used. And so if we write these services that use a lot of, that need the newest hardware to run or that need a lot of hardware to run, it's gonna have a huge carbon impact. And our industry overall has a huge carbon impact. So data centers use, depending what numbers you, you look at, they use between one and 2% of the world's electricity. So that's a, a huge carbon impact. And when you look at the carbon impact of the hardware, that actually dwarfs the carbon impact of the electricity. And there's things that we can do. So we really need to optimize so that our services run on fewer devices. So that's getting that footprint down. We also need to optimize so that the devices we do have have a longer lifetime. Instead of having to throw out servers in three years because they can't cope with a modern workload, let's make it so that they have a longer lifetime. And the, the ways we can do this is, you know, fewer devices, we just need to have a higher efficiency, we need to have that lower footprint, we need to be able to support multi-tenancy at a design level, because then that means that we can pack these things in more tightly. We can give things a longer lifetime by optimizing for longevity and perhaps changing how we think as an industry about planned obsolescence. Maybe planned obsolescence wasn't such a great idea. So to, to wrap up, optimization can seem scary, but it is something that is in within the reach of all of us. And it's actually quite fun to do. But our optimization has to be guided by measurements. And we have to focus, even though optimization is fun, we have to focus on optimizing what matters, what moves the needle, rather than just optimizing to make ourselves feel good. And so with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Holly. Uh, I, I, yeah, so I love your, your conclusions, right? So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a great responsibility that we, we carry in this hand while, you know, touching the... Mm more than the, the mouse and everything. So totally agree with this. And yeah, 
What do you feel? I was wondering where the polar bears are because I saw the trade-offs. I saw the <laughs> bad advice or bad science. <laughs> yeah, I say I save the polar bears till the till the very end. Mm -hmm. That's really really and nice. We also have a question uh, from the audience from Alexandro. I'm going to put it on the screen. Uh, Basically, what it says is that well, uh, we encourage immutability because it's a good thing for many uh, many respects. But at the same time, does it hit the performance? Does it damage the hip and the collection and everything? It's actually it's actually the opposite. So immutability is in general on a modern JVM, it's great for performance. So it it used to be that that garbage collectors how they used to do is they sort of crawl across the whole heap and every single object in the heap they'd look at it and they'd go, okay, is this used or is this well if if it's used, let me make a record of it. Now what they tend to do instead is they'll go through the heap and they only look at objects that are still there. So if an object has been created and then abandoned, it's invisible. And then the garbage collector will take everything that's still alive and copy it to a fresh area of heap. So what that what that means is that you only you only have to garbage collect things that are still alive. If it gets created and thrown out, it's it's almost free. You pay a small allocation cost, but your allocation cost is really cheap because, it, it, again, it used to be that to allocate an object, you'd have to kind of hunt through the whole heap. So you said, OK, I need, I need an object that's 100 big, meg big. Let me look through my heap for, you know, a, a gap that's 100 meg. Now we just say, OK, well, here's my nice, fresh, blank, greenfield heap. I just take 100 meg and, and move my pointer. And so it means that, again, it's sort of it's really hard because we have to unlearn these habits because 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we probably did want to maybe not be super extravagant and just go, I'm going to create an object, I'm going to create an object. But now actually creating objects like that is fine as long as they die early. Yay, thank you so much. So you, you were mentioning you are traveling, I would, uh, I don't know, on vacation maybe or for professional? Yeah, so this this was um, this is something that I you know a, a couple of years ago before the before the pandemic um, when I was going to conferences. Oh, so you were at the conference? Okay. How oh, oh sorry, 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 sorry. I've just worked out your question. I was thinking about I was thinking about taxis and planes, but no, sorry. Yeah, no, I've just I've um I've travelled for Easter to um to go see my in-laws. Okay, okay. so then thank you so much for taking the time once again, you know, for and then uh, being here with us uh, today. Um, but have you been in uh, live conferences so far? I mean, recently? I have, oh, yeah. It's oh, it's, ama it's amazing. Um, so I, I had QCon the other week and it was just so incredible to, you know, to physically sit in the talks. And I have to say, I think some people are probably really good at focusing on virtual talks. And I always focus much better if it's a physical talk, but then, you know, the hallway track and everything. So I think, um, I think Code Camp is my next one. So I'm, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, it's uh, almost a year, a year and some days, right? Uh, oof, a month. A and, month. Yeah. A month, Florian. A month. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I I'm not into, 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 you know, yeah, time. What's time? I mean, <laughs> a year yeah, and a month. Uh, yeah. yeah this is, it's a good one to mention because um, in our uh, mobile app, in CodeCamp app, also mobile and web, uh, there is some uh, a small game where you can redeem coins either by. Uh, asking questions to the session or uh, visiting the booth of our partners. And basically the top leaderboard gets uh, free invitations to the event. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling so, so Alex, Alex Lungu was very active also yesterday with lots of questions. I have, I have a good feeling about uh, Yeah, I think we're going to see each other. Yeah, <laughs> send the invite. All right, Holly, well, once again, thanks a lot for joining us. And oh, uh, see you soon.